Um, but my friend Chris is someone who entered that facility as a boy and who recently graduated into the adult population. And he's a kind of tiny guy. He must be 20 by now, but he still looks like he's 14. I don't know how many of you have known really young people who went to prison, but there is this odd phenomenon where sometimes for decades at a time, men in particular seem to stay really, really young looking. It's as if they're frozen in time in the prison. Part of it is that people can work out and don't have much time to do anything but take care of themselves physically and try to look right. Um, but some of it has to do with their socialization, that people who go to prison really young and who don't have the opportunity to socialize with people of the opposite gender or to interact with folks in a more natural setting because the social environment of the prison is very constructed and very strange. It is not at all the same rules that we operate by in the outside world. And so there are a whole lot of men in particular, because uh, until recently we didn't lock up women that young and keep them there for long periods of time, who appear to be sort of frozen at the age where they entered prison. And Chris is one of those boys. And when Chris went to prison, he was suicidal. He had really had huge struggles in his life before he went to prison. And he tried to commit suicide, I believe, three times since he went to prison. And then he landed in a theater workshop in our, our organization's programming. And uh, at first, he wasn't very compliant. He wasn't very interested in being there. He was kind of sassy, didn't think that he thought he was too cool for it. He was not going to do this this silly theater work with us. And then he discovered that he was actually really articulate and that he liked the spotlight and that we gave him a way to take the spotlight appropriately. Because in prison, a lot of times you don't want to be the center of attention. It's dangerous, particularly for a, a young person or a person who's tiny and vulnerable in a, in a big, adult, scary world. And Chris learned that by being smart and funny, he could get along in the world in ways that would protect him much better than how he had lived before. And he got braver, he got more confident, and he got more interested in living. And his father, who is one of our greatest supporters, who volunteers for everything we do, shows up to every single event, he is the most delightful, sunny, fabulous human being on the planet. His father comes to everything we do and tells everybody that the Prison Creative Arts Project saved his son's life. And uh, Chris, the son, has become a heck of a writer in the time that he has been doing workshops with us. So he started off doing theater and then realized he was more interested in creative writing. Last year, he had a piece appear in the Harvard Educational Review. And right now, he has a piece sitting on the desk of the editor of Harper's Magazine. Incredible. I mean, my husband is a creative writer with an MFA in creative writing, and he would kill to have the publication record <laughs> that Chris has because he's created such extraordinary work, and he's so talented, such a gifted young man, um, and and I feel really, really blessed to know him, and so grateful that he is alive and continuing to work with us. Um, the last story that I want to tell you tonight about how prison arts work changes people's lives is about myself. I was 15 years old when my father became incarcerated. He served 20 years in a Texas prison and came home on May 1st of this year. So I am, thank you. So I have the joy of meeting you in the most joyous time of my life in this this moment when he has returned to us and we are all starting anew. Um, he had a 35-year sentence, and we had no idea how long of that he would serve. But I was a child when he went in. I was a sophomore in high school. And I spent about the first eight or nine years of his incarceration feeling like I didn't know anybody else who had family in prison. I was never told to be ashamed of my father. I never was ashamed of my father. But there wasn't a good place to go besides to my mother to talk about this. And I realized very quickly that it wasn't safe to talk about it with your average human being because people treated me differently. All of a sudden, there were folks who had been my friends in high school who weren't allowed to come over to our house because their families didn't think it was safe for them to hang out with me because somehow the stigma of criminalization affects all of us who have a connection to the prison which is really, really silly, because if you thought my father was the problem and now he's gone, then wouldn't you be safer at my house than you were when you were hanging out with me before? <laughs> it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it's not really about issues of safety or about 
uh, how we function interpersonally, what people actually thought of who I am as a person, it's what they thought of the idea of the prison. The idea of criminality was somehow bigger than the actuality of me. And that was reinforced time and time again. Uh, I applied for colleges and scholarships to go to college, and when I gave some forms that had to do with scholarship application to one of my teachers who knew that my father was in prison, he saw that in the place on the form where it asked what my father did, because they're looking at your income to see how much money you have to go to college, I had said that my father had no income and that he was incarcerated under the box that said profession, which was the truth, and you shouldn't lie about those things. You can actually go to prison for lying on your college application forms. Um, but this teacher, this adult who was supposed to be helping me, who really thought he was helping me, said, you can't say that. You can't tell them that your father is in prison. You need to tell them that he makes license plates or something. You can't just say that he's in prison. And educated people, people who were supposed to help guide me through this transition in life, were so overwhelmed. And most of them were really hurting on my behalf. They wanted to protect me. They wanted to find ways to help me through it. But they didn't have a clue how to talk about it. And a lot of times when I told people that my father was in prison, I ended up spending the next hour and a half comforting them when I was trying <laughs> to say something about myself and my own life. But it was such a shock and such a frightening thing for other people to encounter that I realized that it wasn't worth telling most people. So I didn't lie about my father, but he was kind of a sin of omission. He just didn't exist in a lot of areas of my life. Until I got to graduate school, Despite the fact that I didn't know how to talk about him or where it was safe to talk about him, he is my father, and I adore my father. I have always adored my father, and he is, he is and has been a part of my daily life every day, always. There is not a moment in my life when I don't carry him with me, and his incarceration only heightened that because I couldn't take him to all the places that I wanted to take him to in his physical form. So I didn't know how to say that to people. I mean, it's, we have language, as painful as it might be, for explaining death, but we don't have language for explaining the absence of a living person who you love, who can't come to Father's Day events at school, who can't come to your graduation, who can't give you away at your wedding. How do you honor those people who are not present in our everyday spaces and not forget them and not have to go through this enormous ordeal just to tell people that they exist. How do we do that? It's a really, really hard thing to do. And I was doing all this reading because I wanted to try to understand my father's life. I was reading all of these biographies of people in prison and uh, writings about who goes to prison and how many of us there are. And I realized that while I was in graduate school studying to get my PhD in theater, there were 2.3 million people locked up in this country. There are now 2.5 of us behind bars in the United States. We are locking up more people per capita in this country than anybody has in recorded world history, including slavery. There has been no other country to incarcerate its own people at these rates. And this is astounding, right? This is astounding that we are not talking about this all the time, and that I couldn't find anybody else who had family in prison. How did that make sense? I'd spent eight or nine years of my father's incarceration before I got to this point thinking that I didn't know anybody else who had a loved one in prison. How could that be? So I, um, I decided to start telling everybody that my father was in prison for the ostensible purpose of writing a play about people who have family in prison because I didn't know what to do about his incarceration, but I did know how to do theater. And theater was a thing that had gotten me through a lot of tough things in my life. And so it came to my rescue again. And I told people that I was going to do a documentary play, an interview-based play, about people who had family in prison. And I had good intentions, but I had no idea how this thing would happen or where I would find people who had family in prison. So I just started telling everybody, told everybody I met. In classes, I would find some weird example, some way to tie in the fact that my father was in prison and I was going to write a play about this and I was looking for other people who had family in prison. Um, I'm from Texas and we're very friendly. And if you were standing in line next to me at the grocery store and you struck up a conversation, I would talk to you. And if you asked what I did, I would say, well, I'm a playwright and I'm writing a play about people who have family in prison. And my father's in prison and I'm looking for other people to interview. And people came out of the woodwork like you would not believe. It was, And it wasn't just that people said, oh, me too. It was that people said, that is my life. And nobody ever asked me what happened to my family. 
and it happened everywhere I went. It still happens to me all the time. There is always somebody in a room who says to me, I know what you're going through, and nobody ever cared about what happened to my family. Everybody only cared about the crime that sent that person away. And so all of a sudden, I had tons of people to interview. And all I would say is, I'm the child of a prisoner, and I'm writing this play. And then people would sometimes talk for four hours without stopping. I have no idea if I can interview people, because I never really had to. All I had to say was that this was the thing I'd like to talk about. And then the floodgates opened. And so all of a sudden, I'm sitting on all of this material, and I realize that, gee, I promised people I would write a play. <laughs> and so I wrote a play that is a series of about 13 monologues, different characters who all have different relationships to the prison. And because I was poor and couldn't pay actors to go places with me, I performed it all myself. And I, I wrote a play called Doing Time Through the Visiting Glass that I've been performing since uh, 2004. I've been, gosh, that's 10 years already. Um, I've been touring with the show on and off for about 10 years now, and I thought I'd close this evening by giving you just one of the monologues from the play, and then maybe we can have a conversation about what arts work can do in prisons. She called for a laying on of hands. My hands, a healing. Mama always said I had healing hands. I could cure the sick and heal the wounded. I could suck the aching from your skull or, or slow down your heart if it beat too fast. That's what I do for Mama a lot. Her heart gets to beating fast. And she says to me, child, come here. I need a laying on of hands. And I go to her. And, and I put my, my hands on her chest uh, right under where those two knobbly little bones make little lumps before your neck starts. Right there. Right there. It's just solid bone. And I'd listen to her heart beating, pitter-patter, pitter-patter, way too fast. And I'd say, breathe, Mama. And she does. And then that solid bone place starts to move up and down, real slow, until her heart gets the picture and slows down to more like what her breathing's doing. <laughs> then she puts her hands up to God. That's how she thanks God. <laughs> and then she thanks me by giving me a kiss up on top of my head. <laughs> oh, healing doesn't just work on Mama. I can do it on just about anybody, so long as I can lay hands on them. I got these feelings about who needs healing. I get this, um, I get this hurting feeling in my heart and this empty feeling in my guts, like, like I'm a column of air. Like there's this big space inside me that even an ocean wouldn't fill. And, and I just don't feel better till I got my healing done. So, well, usually I know just who needs healing. And I take off down the road till I find that person. And I lay hands on them and then it's done. But, um, well, I guess I've had this particular feeling now going on three years since they took my daddy and uh, well I go see him about once a week with my mama it's just that I, I can't get the healing done because I can't lay hands on him I uh, I go in the visiting room with mama and I sit there looking at him needing the biggest healing I ever done and I, I put my hands up on the glass. And he does too. But I, I just get so cold. There's nothing colder than that glass in the visiting room and, and that plastic phone on your cheek. And I, and I start to think there must be something wrong with me. Because that cold visiting room is the place that I love most in all the world. This is the place I'm always trying to get back to. I guess, um, I guess it's that hurting part of Daddy calling me back so I can heal him. But, uh, well, who's going to come when I need a laying on of hands? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashley. And if we put our chairs into a circle, we can uh, carry on. And 
it's, it's interesting the ways in which this conversation about families and incarceration is happening in a more public way now in the last few years. Um, Sesame Street actually has a toolkit online for children of incarcerated parents, children ages three to eight who are dealing with that in their home lives. And there's a Muppet named Alex who has an incarcerated parent on Sesame Street. And an, an adult human being talks to him and says, my father was in prison when I was your age, too, and this is what it was like for me. And you can watch the clips online if you go to the Sesame Street website and, uh, and just page through it. You'll find it very easily. And I just sob watching the Muppet who has a parent in prison. It's just the most... I thought it was bad when Mr. Hooper died when I was a child on Sesame Street and Big Bird cried, and nothing has hit me like, like that since. But I, it was inevitable that people would start coming forward. I mean, this is not some great original idea that I had. When you've got 2.5 million people in prison, something like 70 or 80 percent of incarcerated adults have a child under the age of 18, many of them more than one child. So the estimates on how many of us have an incarcerated parent are in the range somewhere of five million kids in the United States alone. So we've got to start having the conversation. It's affected too many people. But in terms of what sells is usually um, the really cheap work up through about $250. Uh-huh. So we're trying to give people pricing guidelines now to help them make right. more money off their art. But some people are pricing deliberately low because they really want our students and their families to be able to afford it, which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, but we add 21% taxes on top of whatever price they name, so they get the price they ask for every Michigan cent. Sales tax. Tax. Michigan sales tax, and then there's a thing called the inmate benefit fund, okay. and the prison takes a cut out of any money made by prisoners, and they put it into a fund that then the people on each wing get to decide how to use it. So sometimes they buy exercise equipment, sometimes they donate it back to us or to other charities. I started performing the play in this very selfish mode of needing to connect with other people who had family in prison because I thought I'd spent so much of my life not knowing, I had spent so much of my life feeling so disconnected from the ability to have one of the most important conversations of my life. And I was very selfishly looking for other people who would talk to me and so I found them in my interviewees but I found them even further in performances of the play because everywhere I go people who have family in prison, even in the most privileged, unlikely spaces, everybody, in a, some, somebody in the crowd has a loved one who's been in prison. Um, so in that sense, it's been inordinately successful. I never lack for people who share that experience now. And it has brought beautiful people into my life, people like Johnny and Nancy, who do this work in the prisons, um, and also a lot of families, a lot of currently and formerly incarcerated people who I would not have gotten to have as part of my life if I hadn't spoken out. Um, it's, it is powerful as a piece of live theater because I always insist on having this conversation afterwards. I never speak anywhere or do the play in any space where I don't insist on having a conversation afterwards. So I've now performed in prisons in many different parts of the US as well as in Canada and Ireland and in all of those places. I've been able to have these incredible conversations with people uh, who are having precisely these struggles with their families. And often in the prisons, people will tell me that they never thought about how their families experienced this trauma. And that sometimes they very deliberately didn't think about it because it was too painful. And at other times, it had just not occurred to them what it really looked like for those of us on the outside. Or they'd started to imagine it, but hadn't been able to fully grasp it. So I, it's, it's been an incredible blessing in my life to be able to do work that is so meaningful to me personally, but that is also meaningful to other people. Um, that said, it always feels like it's not enough. You know, is it successful? It does a good thing and a thing that I'm very proud of and very grateful to be a part of, but there are still a whole lot of kids out there who don't know how to have this conversation and who nobody is giving a forum in which they can have this conversation safely. So it hasn't, my work is not done. I won't say that the play is unsuccessful, but there needs to be a lot more. And in that sense, I feel very small sometimes as a one person show. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I so love my job because now I'm part of this huge arts organization with all of these people. We have over 300 alumni out in the world doing fabulous things in connection to the arts and incarceration. Um, but for a long time until I got there to Michigan in 2013 when I started this job. 
I was very much a one-woman show and feeling the burden of that. But I did perform once for a, a high school speech camp. So I mm -hmm. went through speech camp when I was in high school and one of my former teachers invited me to perform for this big forum of several hundred kids who were interested in theater, not necessarily in prison issues. And um, when I finished performing the play, this giant auditorium of several hundred kids empties out, and we'd had a good conversation. They really got it. They were very interested. They all wanted their own one-person show. <laughs> they, they were very into it for a lot of different reasons, some of them about the theater and some of them about the prison issues. But this professor who had brought me to this university where they were holding the speech camp said to me after the conversation was over, can you please come and see about this girl? She can't stop crying. And she'd been at camp for a couple of weeks already working on her speech pieces for the year and people thought they knew her well but nobody had a clue that her brother was in prison. Mm -hmm. And she had never had a place to talk about it before and she just couldn't stop crying. And so I sat with her for a while, I held her for a while and she told me that her brother had been in prison for, at that point, only six months or something. It was still pretty new. But her mother had fallen into a deep depression. Her father had been unable to go to work because he was so upset and trying to help the mother who wasn't dealing very well. Her parents were talking about divorce. And, and they had told her not to say anything to anybody. Right. They were just going to pretend that brother didn't exist. And, and that happens a lot. You know, Kids are dealing with so much. I met families who told their kids, he works for the government, he travels a lot, he's in school and he'll be home when he graduates. People think that somebody's dead. And then all of a sudden, these real life people show up again years mm -hmm. later. I've had a number of, a startling number of people come up to me after my play and say, I had an uncle that we didn't know existed until I was 20 something and then he showed up and nobody ever told me, nobody ever showed me a picture of my uncle. And then all of a sudden he was back and he was my uncle and we were supposed to figure out what that meant. And so the, the depth of the shame and the pain and the stigma, all of that runs so deep, even for those of us who are pretty functional adults. Mm -hmm. But for kids, it's really, really, really tough. And it's hard to get access to those kids because a lot of the people mm -hmm. putting up the walls around them are the people who are trying to protect them. A lot of families think they're doing the right thing by saying that this person doesn't exist or we're not going to talk about him even if everybody in the house knows where he is or where she is. Mm -hmm. We're just not going to have that conversation. It'll be better for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that does irreparable damage. Was, sociologically, this would be a terribly interesting study if anybody had followed me while it was happening. But people read all kinds of things about themselves into my experience. Some of them were true and some of them weren't. And I was reading lots of things into my interviewees at the same time. I assumed that everybody had this moment that was earth shattering like my family did where you all walked into court one day together and you walked back out without the person you loved. And a lot of the families that I talked to for whom this was an ongoing cycle where people had been in and out of prison. The first guy I interviewed was a friend of mine in grad school who was the only man in his family not to have gone to prison. There was no earth shattering day for him. This was expected. It was coming. It was coming for him. He got out because he went to college and nobody in his family understood that. So the, how we experience it is very personal and individual for, for each group. Um, I think a lot of it is sort of the same principle as talking about other difficult subjects like racism or homophobia or sexism, that if you display a deep concern and an intimate knowledge about it and you bring it up in ways that are thoughtful and productive, it gives other people permission to talk. And it doesn't have to be confessional. It doesn't have to be me saying, I have a loved one in prison, my father was in prison, I had this life experience. I can go into a lot of rooms and say, I do prison arts programming. I think prison arts programming is fascinating and really useful and it does all of these things and I can talk about that. And people will say to me, you know, my brother's in prison and this is what this, and if, if he got to do that, he would be awesome if he could write like what you talk about. And then people start to share because they know that you get it. So it's, it doesn't have to be, my subjectivity opens up the conversation very quickly sometimes if I just walk into a room and say I'm the child of a prisoner and I care about people who also have family in prison but that's not the only route to having the conversation a lot of it is just being an engaged thoughtful informed person who shows compassion and concern in the way that you talk about the issues and I think that if we all talked about it more 
people would say, well, it is okay to talk about it. It's not a thing that I have to hide. If she can talk about it, if she can say, you know, I realize that there are a lot of people who have a family member in prison and they're just walking around dealing with this all the time and there's no good space to talk about that, then people might just think, well, maybe this is the space where I can talk about it. If we could train teachers to do that, that would be so cool. <laughs> Even college teachers, I get a lot of students who say, you were the only person I could ever tell this to. 